This is a joint work with uh, Emmanuel Kieroński and Jan Otop, and it is about uh, modal logic. So let me start with the definition of modal logic. Uh, the syntactic definition is very easy. It's just a propositional logic with two modalities. Square, which is read as uh, it is necessarily that, and diamond, which is read as uh, it is possible that. And why this uh, syntactic definition is very easy, uh, giving the precise semantic is a little bit, differ, uh, a little bit harder. And the first approach to give this semantic was by giving the proof system uh, for this logic. And this proof system was uh, based on a proof system from, for propositional logic. And it was extended by one rule to axioms. And then we say that a formula in, is true in modal logic if it can be proved. And this is nice because it's really easy to uh, extend such a proof system in order to get some richer uh, logics. We just need to add more axioms, and then we can prove more things. Um, one of the most important steps in the history of modal logic was inventing a formal semantics based on the notion of the so-called Kripke structures. Kripke structure is, contains of a direct graph called a frame and uh, evaluation of propositional variables. Here is such a frame, and this is a Kripke structure. And uh, formula square phi can be read here as in all uh, successors phi is satisfied, and diamond phi can be read as in some successors, in some successor phi is satisfied. It turns out that there is a beautiful connection between proof-based and frame-based approaches. Logics defined by axioms can be equivalently defined by restricting classes of frames. Uh, for example, uh, this axiom, diamond, diamond, P, implies diamond, P, uh, it corresponds to the class of transitive frames. And in my opinion, this way of um, defining modal logic by saying that we consider only the class of transitive frames is easier than saying that diamond, diamond, P implies diamond, P. But of course, it's less formal. So we would like to have something formal, but a little bit more uh, simil similar to this thing. So we use first order logic. Uh, so in this talk, I consider class of frames defined by uh, first order logic. And in fact, only universal fragment of, of first order logic. And all those classes can be defined in this uh, universal first order logic. But uh, there is no uh, equality be between those two uh, ways of defining things. The, both those formalisms have a incomparable expressive power. Uh, OK, now uh, I define two decision problems. For a given class of frames k, we define a local satisfiability problem as follows. For a given model formula phi, does there exist a frame k and labeling lambda and the word w such that this frame with this labeling in this word satisfies phi? And the second problem. It's a global satisfiability problem when we, where we ask for the, uh, whether uh, there exists a model such that all words in this model satisfies a given formula. And please note that all, almost all natural classes of frames are defined by formulas with at most three variables. 
And here are some, some examples. Uh, I always speak about uh, universal quantifiers, so I omit them here. So you may think that all those variables are quantified, quantified universally. And natural question we may ask is, uh, are KSAT and global KSAT always decidable for classes defined by first order formulas with three variables? Uh, in 1996, Edith Hamaspandra uh, proved that there exists a universal first order formula that defines class K such that global K sat is undecidable. And this formula is here. Uh, it contains more variables. There are nine variables here. And it contains a quality. And this result was improved 15 years later. Uh, in this paper from MFCS, uh, they removed equality, but now this formula is a little bit more complicated. And they showed also how to uh, prove the same thing for the local satisfiability problem, but now the formula is even more complicated. Our first result is that there exists a universal first order formula with only three variables that defines class K such that global K sat is undecidable. If it has only three variables, then you can guess that it is simpler. And actually, it's very simple because it's just a disjunction of six literals. Uh, our second result is that the same holds for the local satisfiability problem. But then our formula is just a little bit more complicated. And we have uh, similar results for the local satisfiability problem. Uh, sorry, for finite satisfiability problem when we consider only finite models. And after those results, natural question is uh, why standard, logics, standard model logics are decidable. And our answer is that all model logics definable by universal Horn formulas with three variables are decidable. Uh, yeah, yeah, in both. Both local satisfiability and global satisfiability are decidable. But uh, you will see later that there are some difference in, on, in, in complexity. But uh, first, let me start with the uh, undecidability. Okay. So uh, this formula presented earlier can be rewritten as an implication. And what does it say? It says that it is impossible that we have three uh, words, then those two are the only connection among those words. Uh, it says that if there is word X and it is connected to Y and Z, then it has to be at least one additional edge in this triangle here. As usual, when we want to write, uh, we want to encode undecidability problem, we have some canonical structure. And this is our canonical structure. It is gr grid-like structure. And... Uh, Please note that this structure uh, satisfies this formula. In particular, if we take any point, let's say this green one, then, there, then it has three successors, this uh, red one, and there are edges between each pair of those successors. So this formula is satisfied for this grid, and we also have um, model formula that uh, makes every model of this formula looks locally like this grid. And this formula says that each word has at least three successors. Oh, we use uh, nine uh, axillary variables, P00, P01, P02, and so on to P22. And uh, 
This formula says that each word has a horizontal successor, vertical successor, and diagonal successor. And it, this part says that it cannot be connected to its horizontal predecessor, vertical predecessor, and diagonal predecessor. Okay, and how does it work? Um, well, let's consider any word A. This part, again, says that it has three successors. And this um, first order formula says that, because here we have a word and two successors, then there has to be at least one more edge here. But um, this edge cannot be from this word to this, because this is uh, the vertical predecessor of this word. Similarly, it cannot be from this word to this, because this is the horizontal predecessor. And this, this word is the horizontal predecessor of this word. And therefore, the only possibility for another edge here is this dotted edge here. And uh, in the same way, we can prove that this edge here can be from AH to AD. And this is how we enforce that our, our models locally looks like uh, locally look like grids, and when we, once we have a grid, it's really easy to prove that such a logic is undecidable. Simply, we encode some kind of domino problem in it. Okay. And for the local satisfiability case, we use trick uh, presented by. Uh, Edith Hesembra and Schnur, uh, we simply observe that our model formulas works uh, even if uh, all those words here in this grid are reflexive. And the trick is that we add one irreflexive word. We guarantee in this model formula here that such a word exists. We simply say that this initial word satisfies R and all next word satisfies not R. So the word that satisfies this formula uh, cannot be reflexive. And in using the first order formula, we can say that uh, this irreflexive word uh, has to be connected to all reflexive words. And then the question about satisfi satisfiability of uh, phi in all those points can be translated to the question about satisfiability of square phi in this particular world, because now square says that we go to all other worlds. And that's all about our undecidability result. And now a few words about decidability. Uh, Okay, recall that universal Hort formulas are formulas of the form phi1 and phi2 and, and phi j, where each phi i is a Horn clause, and that means that it is a disjunction of literals of which at, mo at most one is positive. Uh, and here's one example. Uh, we usually write such a Horn formulas as implications, and this, formula, this part uh, defines uh, it says that uh, the model, each model is transitive. This is a Horn formula with uh, no positive literals. And of course, there are more examples here. Um, okay, and uh, what is uh, interesting that there is only a finite number of universal Horn formulas with three variables. Well, of course, we can write something stupid like P and P and P and so on, but, but if we exclude uh, this kind of formulas, then there is only finite numbers of such formulas, but this number is still uh, very large. So it is impossible to just check each of them. And, um, okay, so the idea beyond our uh, proof of decidability is that we observe that model logic is decidable to, uh, three mod due to three model property. And in our case, there is no such property. 
but we want to get as close to this mo uh, tree model property as we can. Oh. And we define the closure of tree with respect to universal Horn formula phi as the smallest structure that contains T and satisfies phi. The smallest uh, with respect to the number of edges. And one of our technical lemmas says that if model formula phi is satisfied in some class defined by uh, Horn formula, then there exists a tree such that phi has a model based on the closure of this tree. So what we're going to do is that we are going to uh, study the possible shapes of uh, the closures of tree, depending on the universal formula. We define four simple classes of frames. And we associate each universal Horn formula with one of these classes. And we show that uh, closure of any tree with respect to the universal Horn formula belong to the class associated with this formula. And then we show uh, an algorithm. We show algorithms for all these classes. And now I'm going to give you at first some examples for uh, each classes, then formal definition, and then a few words about algorithms. So the first case is very simple. This formula here, it defines uh, frames in which all words, except for maybe the first one, are reflexive. And another possible formula is this one that says something. But if we apply this formula to this tree, uh, we don't have to add any edges. So Simply, the closure of this tree is this tree. And in this very simple case, uh, we call this class of models uh, semi-trees. We say that a frame is semi-tree if it contains a tree and it is contained in the reflexive symmetric closure of this tree. Okay, So we can add only edges that um, make some words reflexive and some edges symmetric, and that's it. And in this case, we can use standard uh, algorithms to solve the satisfiability problem. And in case of local satisfiability, it leads to p-space completeness. And in case of global satisfiability, it leads to x-time completeness. Second class is a little bit different. This formula here. Uh, it defines uh, transitivity. So all frames, or all closures of all trees with respect to this formula are transitive. And the sec our second class is called a class of transitive trees. And we say that frame is transitive tree if cont it contains tree. It is contained in the reflexive transitive closure of this tree. And it contains uh, long edges just to distinguish it from uh, semi-trees. And another by very easy modification of the standard algorithm, we can show that in this case, both local and global satisfiability problems are p-space complete. The third class is more interesting. Uh, consider this formula. It's, it is. Uh, It says that if x is connected to y and y is connected to z, then z is connected to x. So for this word, it means that from this word, there is an edge to the first word, and so on. And it turns out that um, while this model, which is a closure of this tree, is, uh, seems to be not regular, then we can rearrange the words here and obtain three words 
with this property that every word from this first part is connected to every word from the second part. Every word from the second part is connected to every word from the third part. And every word from the third part is connected to every word from this first part. And in this case, we call it free partition. And we simply say that a frame is a true partition if its words can be partitioned into three independent sets such that there are edges between uh, corresponding sets. And what we do here is that we show that each of the, those three sets can be uh, reduced to the set with polynomial size. And if you have only three sets with polynomial size, then it leads to polynomial mo model property and it leads to NP completeness. Uh, and our last class of frames is uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, consider this formula here. It says that each word, except for words without predecessors or without a predecessor that contains predecessor, are reflexive. Okay, so all those words here are reflexive. And this part says that uh, the successors of reflexive words are connected. And it makes those models look in the following way. We have some three at the beginning of the model, but then we have some number of clicks. All those words here are connected in every possible way. Another example here is uh, as follows. This formula says that all words, except for the words with, without successors, are reflexive. And this formula says that if a word is, um, oh, sorry. Uh, for each word, each, each edge that leads to the word that is uh, not, uh, that, that ha okay, sorry, once again. Each edge that um, leads to the word that is not the last word, it contains, not, uh, it contains some uh, successors, then such edge is symmetric. So at first we add those symmetric edges here, but not here and not here. And this part says that if a word is in symmetric connection with some other word, then it is connected to all other words. And it means that what we obtain here is a big click here, and only those words without successors are not in this click. So to sum up, our definition of the fourth class is pro probably unreadable, but I will read it anyway. Uh, it's as follows. A frame is a click union if it can be partitioned into head, some number of clicks, and tails, where head is a tree in the above, above those clicks. Then we have some clicks and some tails that can be outside of this click, but both this head and tails are uh, of height at most two. And in this case, uh, we prove that it is enough to consider only polynomial number of clicks with polynomial size, and it leads to the polynomial model property, and it leads to NP completeness. Uh, so to sum up, we proved those three results. And the complexity for the third result is presented in this table. So thank you for your attention.